Well, I'm speaking to you now chiefly as president of the Society for the Promotion of Hellenic Studies. This is a UK umbrella group known for short as the Hellenic Society. It aims ideally to bring together all those of all ages and outlooks who share that promotional goal and who wish either to publish in uh, our two journals, the Journal of Hellenic Studies, and its much more recently born sister publication, Argo, or to share somehow in our menu of seminars, panel discussions, and lectures, which go on throughout the year, now of course more often online and virtually, rather than in reality and face-to-face. But I also address you as an honorary citizen, an epidemosimodis of Sparta, not ancient Sparta, but modern Sparta. As many of you will already know, we Spartans boast a rather special place in the history and memory of the 1821 uprising. The chronological remit of the Hellenic society is very broad indeed. We don't just promote the study of Hellenic antiquity, nor even of Byzantine Hellenism. But through the wonder term reception studies, we also claim as our province all Hellenic studies from the Renaissance right up to today. However, I am forced to admit that as the society was not actually founded until 1879, I can't honestly claim that any of our members were 1821ers, as it were. Had those uh, events, the revolution, the uprising occurred in, let's say, the 1880s, I'd have been very quick indeed to offer you Oscar Wilde, famous classicist and Hellenist, member of the first board of the Journal of Hellenic Studies, who was, of course, a revolutionary, both in his ideas and in his life. So instead, I'm just going very briefly to introduce you to five proxies, five men, uh, sorry, yes, all men, who in their very different ways both promoted Hellenism and Hellenic studies and have a very direct bearing on the revolutionary ideas of 1821 and their migration. Two of them as actual protagonists and participants in the revolution. John Keats, Percy Bysshe Shelley, George Gordon, Lord Byron, Prince Alexander Mavrokordatos, and last but very much not least, Adamandios Korais. First up, Keats. The bicentenary of his death falls actually tomorrow. He died in Rome on February the 23rd, 1821. Many of you probably know his ballad, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, but for us today, it's his sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer and one of his six odes on the Grecian urn that hit the sweet poetic spot. Keats died not in Greece, but in Italy, as did Shelley, a revolutionary thinker expelled as an undergraduate from our mutual Oxford College, University College, for publishing a tract on atheism. Shelley was a translator of ancient Greek, Plato's Symposium, as well as a poet who celebrated his Hellenic inheritance. He was conspicuously anti-tyrannical, composing a Prometheus Unbound. Most famously, though of course, controversially. He once wrote, we are all Greeks, our laws, our literature, our religion, our arts have their root in Greece. Now that was in the preface, 1821, to a work entitled precisely Hellas. Shelley was, in a word, a Phil Hellene. So too his very good friend Byron, to me, Byron has one very special recommendation. His campaign on behalf of a certain famous temple that adorned and still adorns the Acropolis of Athens. Bit of a clue if you look behind me. But probably to most of us, 
Byron's special claim to fame and remembrance is that he put his life where his ever fertile poetic mouth had gone before, dying for the Hellenic cause at Missolonghi in 1824. And it was thanks to Prince Alexander Mavrocordatos, a mutual friend also of Shelley, that Byron made the trip to central Greece. But I'm going to leave you not with him, but with Adamandios Corais, after whom a distinguished chair at KCL, King's College London, is actually named, held successively by Roddy and now Honda. On what I think and hope is good authority, Corais is said to have been inspired by, and indeed to have quoted from, an ancient Greek play, our earliest surviving ancient Greek tragedy, the Persians of Aeschylus, Aeschylus, which provides me with an especially fitting close, an occasion to remind us of another anniversary being commemorated and indeed celebrated in 2021, namely the 2500th anniversary of the Battle of Salamis, Salamina today, fought in 480 BC or BCE. So if you have been, thanks for listening. I hand over the torch to Roddy, but I say, first of all, Yamas, <laughs> with the real genuine ancient Greek helix. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for setting the uh, setting the scene so ably and in such a such a broad, wide, wide ranging uh, manner. Um, this, as John mentioned at the beginning, is the the second half of a diptych. We started um, all of a week ago um, with a similar panel and. The original idea of this uh, this collaboration, it's a series of collaborations between the British School at Athens and the Centre for Hellenic Studies at King's, and now joined uh, by the um, Hellenic Society as well. The original um, concept of this was that we were going to have, um, we were actually going to meet, remember when we did things like that? <laughs> we were actually going to meet in a room um, in uh, Athens last week, and then at King's in London today. So the panels were uh, drawn up in such a way that um, last week's panel were scholars who were based in Greece, um, in Athens, and uh, this week's um, are people based in London. Well, of course, as um, our world has been turned somewhat upside down, um, in a way, it doesn't matter where any of us, where any of us is, but um, that just by way of explanation. I thought before I say a few words to introduce tonight's uh, three panelists, I thought I would very briefly, um, as they do in sort of TV serials, just give you a very brief snapshot of where we where we got to at the end of last week. Um, our three panelists, all Athens based last week, were focusing more specifically on the on Greece and the Greek Revolution itself, how the ideas got to Greece. Um, they themselves focused primarily on the Greek world. Today, with our notional London focus, we're opening out the, uh, we're broadening the spectrum and inviting speakers whose own expertise um, and sometimes their own personal backgrounds come from beyond Greece, as it were, looking in from a broader perspective. So the story so far, um, Ada Diala uh, told us how ideas which are today highly topical about slavery and its abolition had played an important part at the Congress of Vienna in 1814 and 1815 at the end of the Napoleonic Wars and um, showed us that actually um, in a rather surprising way Russian diplomacy at that time had rather exploited and appropriated abolitionist rhetoric as a kind of handle for um, uh, to talk of the liberation of the um, orthodox subjects of the Ottoman Empire. Then <clears throat> the historian Efi Ghazi teased out the previous lives of the Greek revolutionary slogan, liberty or death, through literary and political contexts in England, Germany, the United States and France, showing how its nuances and significance were modified with each new context until it wound up in Greece in the 1820s. And finally, Kostas Tambakis, um, whose background is in, he's a, his, a historian of science, 
showed how the growth of the natural sciences among the elite of the Greek Enlightenment in the 18th century became caught up in the ferment of ideas that fueled the revolution of 1821, and then became vindicated with the establishment of Greece as a largely secular state in the 1830s, in which the sciences flourished. Well, tonight we take the discussion forward into new areas and new forms of the migration of revolutionary ideas. So <clears throat> I'll now introduce the three speakers who will move seamlessly from one to the other to avoid any uh, further interventions from me until we reach the question and answer session um, in the la la latter part of our event. So um, we have slightly changed the order in, from the way it was originally advertised. Um, Sanya Perovitz will speak first. Sanya is a reader in 18th century French studies at King's College London. In 2018, she co-edited a volume of the journal Comparative uh, Critical Studies on the French Revolution Effect. <clears throat> Since then, she has been directing a research project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, UK, on <clears throat> radical translations, the transfer of revolutionary culture between Britain, France, and Italy, 18, uh, 1789 to 1815. Well, Greece is surely a necessary next step, Sandia, beyond that uh, uh, inspired research project. Next up will be Iorios Varouksakis, professor in history of political thought at Queen Mary University of London and co-director of the Center for the Study of the History of Political Thought. During this academic year, he is senior research fellow at the Lichtenberg Kolleg at the University of Göttingen in Germany. Iorios is the author of several books on international relations, um, on British and French uh, political history, and is now working on a major new study on the title is The West, The History of an Idea, to be published by Princeton University Press. And our final panelist this evening is Athena Leusi, Associate Professor in European History in the Department of Languages and Cultures at the University of Reading. Athena is the founder of the Association for the Study of Ethnicity and Nationalism, known by the initials ASEN, and a founder editor and continuing editor of the journal Nations and Nationalism. She co-edited the, vol co the volume Nationalism and Ethnosymbolism in 2006, which remains a standard point of reference for the worldwide study of the subject, one which I'm sure many of us, um, many of us listening tonight have read uh, and reread with great profit. So that's uh, enough from me <clears throat> as part of the fi final stage of scene setting. So I hand over now to Sanya Perovitz um, to uh, talk about the French Revolution effect and how it, trans it migrated towards, towards Greece. Sanya, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to just share my screen now, and hopefully this will work. Should um, and share, and just do that. Everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm definitely on the broadening side of this uh, discussion because I'm hardly a specialist of the Greek Revolution, but hopefully I'll make a few uh, remarks just in passing about it. Um, so as soon as it broke out, uh, the French Revolution was recognized as an event whose repercussions went well beyond politics and the French border. In 1798, Friedrich Schlegel cited as commonplace the view that the revolution had been, quote, an almost universal earthquake in a measurable flood in the political world. In 1809, Coleridge described the French Republic as the main outlet and chief crater of the volcanic torrents, which like the lavas of Vesuvios, were to subside into a soil of inexhaustible fertility. From the outset then, the French Revolution was experienced not so much as a foreign idea or, ex um, or experience emanating from an exclusively French core, but as a material force that continually reverberated, producing ever new interpretations. To be revolutionary in this sense, was to continually change and alter one's perspective on the historical past. 
But when the revolutionary armies began to export the revolution by military force, a whole new set of contradictions emerged. While the French revolutionaries may have thought that they were exporting republicanism, their European neighbors saw themselves as originators of the very ideas that they now had to catch up with. The Roman res publica, Athenian democracy, German Freiheit, these were some of the concepts that the French now appeared to be returning to their place of origin. So what had previously been relatively abstract notions of rights, freedoms, and citizenships now became carriers of different and at times contradictory meanings. They became, in other words, what the political theorist Elias Palti calls political languages, terms whose meaning can only be debated and never be resolved. And as he describes it, he says, it's the simultaneous necessity and impossibility of political language defining concepts that opens the field of politics that makes concepts political concepts. So in the time that remains, I want to focus more specifically on what translation can tell us about the mobility of revolutionary language, what was said, where it went, and what it became. And as my job on this panel is to comment on the antecedents of the Greek Revolution of 1821, I'd like to begin briefly, just mentioning a few brief words about the Greek context, uh, with the famous translation by Rigas of the French Constitution of Year Two in 1797. And of course, the French Constitution of Year Two, this was the radical constitution that promised universal manhood suffrage and had been forbidden in every country in Europe uh, by this point. And this translation cost him his life. As our own chair, uh, Roderick Beaton has observed, the very form of its title, which vastly expanded the original, demonstrates a remarkable transposition of imported ideas in a completely new context. So as I've already said, I'm not a Greek specialist, so I had to get some help, <laughs> chiefly from my part, husband, <laughs> to translate this with a bit of Google Translate um, in English. But I thought that, that just to have a look at Article 22 is really instructive. So this is the article uh, that describes education. And as you can see, uh, the French is short and sweet and quite abstract. And uh, Rigas's Greek translation is much more elaborate. And I think what Rigas does here is um, emblematic of something that's quite common um, uh, throughout uh, the revolutionary period. He expands, he elaborates, and he also renders more concrete and original text. And if we just look here, um, the French, for example, has the term la société. Uh, and he uses another term, which I guess can be translated as homeland. Uh, the French makes uh, a reference to la raison publique. Uh, Rigas makes specific reference to the education of boys and girls and also the freedom of nations. And he uh, talks about the languages that will be taught. And he makes some remarks about the differences between a rural and a more cosmopolitan or urban education. And, <clears throat> His uh, translation, I think, raises a number of interesting uh, questions about translation more generally, especially when it's done by militants. Uh, what happens when people interpret their reality with ideas developed elsewhere that might be, be considered out of place? How was translation used to take advantage of an opening that was historically possible in one place to create a wedge, a crack, or an opening in another? And how does the translation of a foreign text or idea require getting to the roots of political and social inequality in one's own context? So for the remainder of my talk, um, I want to just show um, other examples uh, that aren't uh, Greek um, that I think um, exemplify uh, the centrality of translation uh, for the revolution. And I want to begin a little bit earlier in the 1780s uh, with a well-known text um, that demonstrates the kind of cosmopolitan republicanism that perhaps Regus was also trying to evoke. And this is um, a text uh, called The Considerations on the Order of Cincinnatus, which is um, commonly taken to be the first uh, attack on the principle of nobility. And here we see uh, it in a French translation by Mirabeau. Um, uh, that um, it vastly expands the text. So the original was written by the Irish American soldiers, soldier Edinus Burke. And when Mirabeau translated this rallying cry for abolishing hereditary privilege, the result was a much expanded text. It included letters by Washington, Turgot, uh, a piece by Richard Price that's evocatively titled, 
observations on the importance of the American Revolution and the means of making it a benefit to the world. Here, an ostensible translation becomes a veritable portmanteau of revolutionary writings. And of course, Mirabeau instrumentalized all aspects of the text for his purposes. Here we have an example of him saying, you should also have a look at the publisher's errata that are published inside the little slips of paper that will tell you uh, how to read the text and what you should get out of it. Um, now, what's interesting is that the story doesn't end here. This text was almost immediately translated back into English by Samuel Romilly, uh, the, um, anti, the, the abolitionist and um, the uh, civil rights advocate, who in typical 18th century fashion, immediately added his own preface and footnotes. And I think this extended translation of a text from English to French and back to English again, offers a privileged insight into how revolution in the 1780s was still imagined in a plural and comparative context. And it also shows how revolutionary ideas unfolded in their own present. These translations, I think it's fair to say, are political acts in their own right. They exceed any putative original or source text. And this phenomenon continued all throughout the revolutionary period. Another well-known example is that of Thomas Paine. Um, his text, Age of Reason, was actually first published in a French translation in 1793, and it was repackaged alongside another text, which was dedicated to all the sans-culottes of the French Republic and to our descendants, as you can see here on the slide. And the original actually wasn't published until a year later. This time, um, by, it, it included a dedication by Thomas Paine himself uh, to my fellow citizens of the United States of America. And this was actually written, um, published while Thomas Paine was in prison um, in Paris. So already we see here with these two, uh, with one text, the same idea, two versions, two translate, uh, a translation and an original, how um, an age of reason uh, was becoming fractured, uh, stained with irreversible and contingent um, historical events from which there is no turning back. Translations are also vital carriers of uh, revolutionary memory and allow us to recover traces of revolutionary lives otherwise lost to us. And this is an interesting text by Helen Maria Williams, who was a stalwart amongst the British radicals based in Paris. And it's an important text um, because it's an eyewitness account from someone situated in the thick of the action. But it also contains within it the memoirs of the Neapolitan patriot in exile, Amodio Recchiardi. And um, the original of this text has, is lost. It, it, it hasn't been found. Um, so essentially, the only evidence we have of this really vital mem memoir is through her translation of it. And this is an important text because within this uh, uh, translation, uh, there's also included um, justificatory pieces inculpating Lord Nelson in the downfall of the Neapolitan Republic and the mass execution of most of its leaders. So it's, it's, a, it's a very explosive uh, uh, thing that you find in the middle of this other text. And this, of course, was immediately translated uh, into French by Sophie Grandchamp, uh, who was a close intimate of Madame Roland and an important um, eyewitness uh, of events in her own right. And this translation, um, as Grandchamp says in um, her epigraph, was completed in friendship and in haste. And I think this could serve as an, as an epigraph for many translations of this period, often published in short-lived newspapers or ephemeral pamphlets. Translations, as we already saw with Rigas, became ways of demarcating new distinctions between friends and enemies that went beyond the established boundaries of nation, church, or state. And they can help us recover forgotten or pseudonymous lives. Translations could also be dangerous, as we already saw uh, the case with Rigas. But other cases include translations made by the French government of letters of support written to them um, by the London Corresponding Society, and these translations were used as evidence of treason in the trial against the British radicals. And translation could also be used covertly as a way to communicate revolutionary ideas in periods of repression or censorship when they couldn't be expressed outright. And finally, um, translation allows us to reconsider uh, the mobility of revolutionary language itself. 
It is estimated that the French Revolution increased the vocabulary of the French language by 15%. Yet when the famous Dictionnaire d'Académie Française uh, published its fifth edition in 1798, this is sort of France's equivalent of the Oxford English Dictionary, um, only 418 neologisms, revolutionary neologisms were included. And these were relegated to a supplement. In the main dictionary, under the term revolution, there is reference to the Roman, Swiss, and Swedish revolutions, but not a mention of recent events in France. And tellingly, this supplement was first published in German translation before the original came out in France. And this demonstrates, uh, to my mind, once more the view, how the view from outside and away from the epicenter of action reveals a side to revolution that considerations from the center of political activity alone cannot. And it was not just the analogisms. The revolution ushered in a completely new relation to time and history in which present and future usages of words mattered more than their established or historical meaning. And perhaps another example that's relevant for the Greek context, given the connections between Greek and Italian patriots, was the enormous influence of revolutionary terms on the Italian language, um, as um, Erasmo Lesso has demonstrated. Um, terms such as regalista, vandalo, and vandalismo, and sonculotto are some examples of the many polemical terms that entered common parlance. But was an Italian royalist the same as a French royalist? Could there be an Italian sans culotte without the political clubs and popular actions associated with the term? And similar questions can be posed uh, regarding the expansion of the semantic fields associated with the term publico or public. And this includes terms such as the public good, public administration, public education. We already saw that this um, in uh, the, the translation, um, Rigas's translation. And finally, my personal favorite, which is um, that ever elusive term of public happiness. So um, as my examples of, have hopefully shown, a consideration of how revolutionary language was adapted, adopted, resisted, or rejected reveals, reveals much about how the French Revolution was continually re reinterpreted as it reverberated across Europe and the world. Um, translation, translators' choices are opportunities um, for a very rich analysis of political language. So this question of whether the translator prefers the term société or homeland, la patrie, whether they use the term freedom or liberty, rights or privileges, mankind or the majority of people, in each case, possibilities are either opened or closed by the choice that is made. As we already saw with Rigas, translations reveal multiple and crisscrossing histories that unfold in several directions at the same time. They also enable us to reconstruct political and intellectual history uh, in a short time frame, as it was experienced by participants themselves um, from uh, their own point of view. And finally, and this is going to be my last remark. Um, at the core of these extensive translation activities uh, lies a complete reconceptualization, I think, of the power of translation. And this is really the revolutionary contribution maybe to language um, in this period. And the problem faced by many uh, militants um, is a wholly new problematic of how to translate democratic ideas into lived experience. And this was a political as well as linguistic problem. How far could revolution go and where did resistance lie? Thank you. Oops. And I'm just going uh, to stop sharing if I can <laughs> find where I am. Uh, there we are. Right. Oh, I've lost my Zoom. How do we recover it? I'm going to try to stop sharing. And I don't know how to do it. Can someone start sharing, maybe? Athena?
can you, I can't find any more. Um, Uh, there we go. Now I can stop sharing. Okay, great. I think, yes, I, yes, great. You disabled me. I'm sorry, I couldn't, <laughs> because you had to come out. Yeah, so, sorry. I have now stopped sharing, I hope. No? Yes, yes. Yes, you have, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <Thank you. laughs> sorry. Qui se souvient aujourd'hui de l'émotion qu'éveillait le nom seul de la Grèce de 1821 à 1829, wrote Edgar Quinet in 1857. Who remembers today the emotion that the very name of Greece was arous arousing from 1821 to 1829? What emotions Greece evoked and what the idea of Greece meant to people before and during the Greek revolution is a complex matter. A lot of work has been dedicated to the writings of travelers to Greece and the image of the inhabitants that travel accounts provided from the late 17th century onwards. Some of the travelers understood or even cared to understand very little of the people living in the country they purportedly described. As Claude Fauriel, complained in 1824 in the discours preliminaire of his collection of Greek folk songs, the travelers had proved themselves determined in advance to go into ecstasies on even the most doubtful vestiges of what Greece had been two or 3000 years ago, yet did not speak but in passing of the seven or 8 million people who were the certain remains the, li the living remains of the ancient people of that land that they idolized. Or as Armand Carrel put it in 1829, most readers, when educate, even educated, after having followed the ancient Greek nation until the complete destruction of the low empire, have lost view of it as of the conquest of Constantinople. They see a general insurrection in 1820 it was that insurrection that informed them of the existence of a people they thought extinct. Now, for those who had heard of some people, uh, sorry, of those who had heard such a people, of such a people before the 1820s, the most likely image of the Greeks spread by travelers account was that their degradation was that of their degradation, excuse me, as compared with the Greeks of classical times. David Hume's unflattering references to the dishonesty of the Greeks in his essay on national character was typical. There were, of course, some opportunities to meet Greeks without traveling to Greece. When he went to Leipzig to study in, 1820, uh, in, in 1765, Goethe wrote with some pride to his sister that everything in Leipzig was more colorful than their native uh, in their native Frankfurt. He was especially charmed by the Greeks, descendants of the ancient people he knew only from books. The question of the Greeks as a potential political entity came to be considered by West European observers from the time of the Russo-Turkish War of 1768-74 and Catherine the Great's purported intentions with regard to liberating the Greeks. Her friend and correspondent Voltaire was sending her flattering letters, encouraging her to conquer Constantinople, Byzantium, as he put it, and resuscitate Athens and the Greeks. Voltaire was not alone in wishing the Turks expelled from the country of Xenophon and Plato. In an essay written in 1802 or 1803, Henri de Saint-Simon was describing what he presented as a vision that he had seen consisting of a plan to read Europe forever of the scourge of war. Among, the, among other things, he wrote, Europeans will unite their forces and free their Greek brothers from the domination of the Turks. Around the same time, the idea of driving the Turks out of Europe and creating a viable Greek state on the European side of their territories was being contemplated in St. Pender's book as well. In 1803, Prince Adam Jartoriski, who was mentioned by Ada last week, 
wrote sur le système politique que devrait suivre la Russie présentée à l'empereur Alexandre. In it, the Polish aristocrat advised the Russian Tsar on the policies that would be in Russia's interests to pursue. When it came to La Turquie, he suggested that it would suit Russia to have on the European side of the Dardanelles a viable power that was not likely to get on with the Turks and also that was not one of the other great European powers. That power was the Greeks who were able to govern themselves and on whom Russia owed and could to ensure an influence by the good it would do to them and by the promise of liberty and good government. Incidentally, the same Czartoryski later in 1830 was to subtitle his book, Essay sur la Diplomatie, Manuscrit d'un Philelin, Manuscript of a Philelin. That same year, 1803, Adamantius Corais was presenting his Memoir sur l'état de la civilisation dans la Grèce to the, uh, Société, to the Société des Observateurs de l'Homme in Paris. He repeatedly called what had been going on in Greece since the middle of the 18th century a révolution morale. He emphasized the successful efforts of the Greeks to promote education and their, adva and their great advances in shipping and trade. Some, however, were decidedly skeptical about the Greeks. Joseph de Mestre, Savoyard philosopher and diplomat, was ambassador of the Kingdom of Sardinia to Russia from 1803 to 1817. He finished writing his book on the Pope, Du Pape, before leaving St. Petersburg in 1817. Besides a tirade of criticisms of the ancient Greeks, Mestre had strong views on the contemporary Greeks as well. A fatal error of Greece, and which unfortunately has not the, the appearance of coming soon to an end, is that it relies upon ancient recollections in attributing to itself, I know not what imaginary existence, which never ceases to, de to, de to deceive it. I know that it wrote the Iliad, that it sculptured the Apollo Belvedere, that it gained the Battle of Plataea, but all this is very ancient. And to speak candidly, a slip of two and 20 centuries very much resembles death. But then he leaves scope for a version of Greece to be accepted and embraced on the Catholic terms, provided it sheds its Byzantine accretions. May Greece proper, the Greece so well defined by Cicero, separate forever from the fatal, that fatal Byzantium, whose imaginary supremacy is wholly founded on titles which no longer exist. We are told of Phocion, of Pericles, of Epaminondas, of Socrates, of Plato, of Agisilaus, etc., etc. Let us treat then with their descendants without troubling ourselves about the municipia. There is on our side neither hatred nor any bitterness of feeling. Let us embrace once more, never again to be thrown asunder. In comparing the modern Greeks, uh, the modern and ancient Greeks. Demestre was of course in good company by 1817. But alike, unlike Mestre, most of those who made the connection in the coming few years would do so not in order to dismiss the connection as he half of the time did, but rather most commentators evoked an obligation the beneficiaries of the legacy of ancient Greece had to the descendants of the glorious Hellenes. The mania for classical Greek art and Greek ideals had been well established by the end of the 18th century. Johann Joachim Winkelmann, Friedrich August Wolf, and others in Germany had worked to create the tyranny of Greece over Germany. And through the tyranny of German universities over America, the mania for Hellenic literature, art, and architecture had, tra had traveled far. Thus, one does not need to be too cynical to accept what the Irish-born American journalist, editor of The Nation, Edwin Godwin, God, Godkin, excuse me, noted in an 1877 article on the Eastern question. Interest in Turkey was only revived by the Greek insurrection in which the atrocities of the Turks excited general horror, 
though probably few remembered that the methods of warfare to which they resorted in that case were precisely those which they had employed in suppressing Christian revolts in Serbia during the rising of 1804 and 1815. But Serbia lay out of the track of Western travel or observation. The Serbian Christians too, like the other Slavonic subjects of the port had no sentimental hold on the Western imagination, such as that which gave the Greek rising of 1821 so much pathos and dignity. The Slavs had no history that scholars and poets knew or cared about. There is little doubt that the association of the insurgent Greeks with the ancient Hellenes was crucial to many of their supporters. Perhaps the most famous articulation of what the classicist jo Johanna Kanning has recently called the classical debt was contributed by Percy Shelley, already mentioned by Paul, writing in, from Pisa in November 1821 in the preface to his lyrical drama, Hellas. The apathy of the rulers of the civilized world to the astonishing circumstance of the descendants of that nation to which they owe their civilization, rising as it were from the ashes of their ruin is something perfectly inexpl inexplicable. We are all Greeks, Paul read the rest, thankfully. So an initial answer to our question, what the idea of Greece meant by the 1820s certainly is that to many outside it, Greece meant the would-be resurrection of the descendants of the ancient Hellenes, which they wanted their governments to assist in recognition of the debts to their of their civilized the debts of their civilization to the ancient Greeks. But what prevailed even more among most of the people I have studied were evocations of shared Christendom, which of course to some of them meant the same thing as Europe, though not always. As far as Germany was concerned, the historian Christoph Hauser uh, has concluded that it was the Christian faith of the Greeks as against the barbaric beliefs of the Turks that was evoked most heavily in attempts to raise funds for the Greek cause. Meanwhile, at least in the southwestern German states that Hauser focuses on, evocation of Greek antiquity played a rather minor role. Christianity was crucial to the popularity of the Greeks cause also in France, where unlike in Britain, the Greeks were supported by people from all sides of the political spectrum. A striking case of the evocation of the ties of Christendom was the pamphlet published in 1825 by Benjamin Constant on behalf of the Comité des Grecs of the Société de la Morale Chrétienne and entitled Appel aux Nations Chrétiennes en faveur des Grecs appeal to the Christian nations in favor of the Greeks. The committee included distinguished members such as Constant's fellow Protestant, the historian and future premier, Francois Guizot. Constant's pamphlet used many different arguments, but the Greeks being Christians fighting against Muslim conquerors was the main argument. Meanwhile, there was not a single word on the ancient Greeks and any classical debt. Another much longer publication emphasizing paying attention to the modern Greeks as opposed to the ancient Hellenic glories came shortly afterwards the same year. Armand Karel published his history of the modern Greeks since the Turkish conquest also in 1825. Karel challenged what he described as the two inadequate explanations of the outbreak of the revolution. One, those who argued that the revolution had been the natural result of the revival of the spirit of liberty among the descending posterity of the Thebans, Spartans, and Athenians on the one hand, and those who argued that it was the civilizing power of the gospel that was bound to triumph over the inferior virtues of the Quran on the other. Karel offered a much more complex explanation involving long-standing, diverse and conflicting interests among various social and local groups of Greeks, contingency, and especially the role of Ali Pasha and the blunders of the Ottoman port in, a port in, explaining, and, um, in explaining the outbreak and also the course of the revolution. Karel wrote that he hoped by writing his history to interest in the liberation of Greece, une nation faite pour sympathiser avec tous les peuples en lutte contre l'esclavage 
referring obviously to the French, a nation made for sympathizing with all the peoples struggling against tyranny, against slavery, excuse me. Besides the French, there was another nation that saw itself as made to sympathize with all people struggling against tyranny. After all, the American Revolution had preceded the French. The young George Pancroft, future doyen of American providentialist national historiography, secretary of the Navy and senior diplomat, was writing from Paris on the 4th of July, 1821, of a dinner among Americans in Paris to celebrate their national day with General Lafayette present. Toasts were drunk and volunteers given. I gave the land of Minerva, the birthplace of arts, philosophy, and freedom, civilizing her conquerors in her decline, regenerating Europe in her fall. May her, may her sons rebuild in her climbs the home of liberty. The contest of the Greeks at present is too interesting a subject to be talked of lightly or to be regarded as a commonplace of war or ambition of war of ambition as a commonplace war of ambition or interest, excuse me. It is a nation rising against tyranny and vindicating the rights of man. And although he was in Paris, 32 years after the outbreak of the French Revolution, Pancroft went on to write, since the days of the American war for independence, there has been no scene of exertion so glorious as this. It was typical of Americans, by the way, to talk of the Greek Revolution as modeled on their own and to draw attention to the parallels and therefore the need to support it. Now, near the end of the decade, back in Massachusetts, Bancroft concluded an article on Russo-Turkish Russo wars by arguing that the peace of Adrianople is favorable to the best interest of civilization. After explaining what the treaty of that year, 1829, meant for Serbia and the principalities, he exclaimed, but above all, Greece is restore, restored to the affections of humanity. And in a clear allusion to Byron's verse in the Gaou, it is Greece, but living Greece no more, Bancroft concluded, it is indeed Greece and live in Greece. She reappears to take her place in the family of nations. Her star ascends brightly through a sky that no longer lowers. Now, before going to Paris to toast the land of Minerva, Bancroft had studied and been awarded his PhD from the University of Göttingen. His journal provides a glimpse of his departure from Göttingen in September, 1820. I had formed a plan of traveling to Berlin with two Grecians, Mavros and Polizoidis. Yes, Polizoidis. Many of their countrymen were desirous of accompanying us a few miles. At noon, we reached Nordheim. Here we dined for the last time in company with our Grecian friends. The hour at table was indeed moving. The welfare of our friends and our countries was drunk with enthusiasm. After dinner, a Greek war song was sung which animated every heart. Young Vlastos from Hios, a pleasant little fellow whom I was especially fond of, could hardly restrain his feelings. Silas from Athens arose and addressed his Grecian brethren in a, in a short song, animating them to exertion and patriotism. Pancroft had been preceded by Edward Everett, who was the first American ever to receive a PhD, also in the University of Göttingen to be followed by many other German educated Neue Amerikaner, as they were known in Germany. Like Bancroft and all good Americans, Everett, Everett also spent much time in other parts of Europe, not least Paris, where he learned modern Greek and had repeated meetings with Adamantios Korais. Much more rarely for an American at the time, Everett also traveled to Greece before returning to Harvard. Everett became the most influential person in American philhellenic agitation in the 1820s. Besides many campaigning lectures and speeches, in October 1823, he published a crucial article in the North American Review, whose editor he was at the time. The pretext was a long review article on Corais's edition of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. But besides commenting on the edition and on Corais's other Hellenic nomarchy, norm, no, Nomarchy, excuse me, uh, excuse me, Hellenic library texts. 
Everett included in the article, the whole of the Pro provisional constitution of Greece of January 1822, the letter of the Messenian Senate signed by, by Mavromichalis sent to himself through Korais and addressed to the Americans in May 1821, comments on the massacre of Hios and much more. Most importantly, and I will conclude very, very shortly with this, he used the facts and context related to the publication under review to measure the state of civilization of modern Greece. Criticizing the routinely contradictory and often splenetic accounts of travelers, he argued that the facts of recent decades were that, first, the Greeks were in their religion Christians of a most ancient and venerable communion. Second, the state of education in Greece is a fact before the world, which entitles them to our sympathy as a civilized people. Several of their high schools compare advantageously with those of Europe. That of Hios before its late destruction was perhaps equal to any seminary of learning in the United States of America. A library of 10,000 volumes had already been collected. To put it in context, Harvard at the time had 20,000 volumes in its uh, uh, university library. Uh, and then he went on to talk about the Greeks who studied in Germany, Italy, and France, saying that he had personal uh, experience of what he was talking about and what it meant. And thirdly, the Greeks were an enterprising and industrious people. The Greek marine is a proof of astonishing perseverance and enterprise. The, the upshot was that the Greeks are a Christian, civilized, enterprising, industrious people and entitled to the sympathy of the civilized world in their present contest against the Turks. Most of Everett's arguments about the progress of the Greeks uh, were, by the way, strikingly reminiscent, reminiscent of Korais's memoir of 1803. It is worth noting that in this, the most significant contribution to the American philhellenic agitation in the hegemonic North American Review, its editor, the most influential voice in American philhellenism, who was moreover the first professor of Greek literature at Harvard, did not just avoid references to the classical debt, as a reason for the support of the Greeks that he was advocating. He moreover proceeded to draw attention to that omission explicitly, though also rhetorically astutely. In the few re remarks which we have taken the liberty to make on this occasion, we have not insisted on the topic of the glorious descent of the Greeks, of the duty of hastening to the succor of those whose father, fathers were the masters of the world in the school of civilization. It is not because we are not sensible to the power of this appeal also, but because we think a much stronger appeal may be made. While that kind of sympathy was perfectly natural, Everett believed, the Greeks have stronger and more imperious claims upon us than any that grow out of these associations. We may differ as to the degree of respect to which their ancestors are entitled. We may differ as to the degree in which the modern Greeks are really the descendants of the ancient inhabitants of the soil. Many travelers tried to prove they were not, he, he says. The allusion to antiquity, moreover, often borders on the ridiculous. There is enough without these names to awaken sympathy. A very final point deserves notice, that deserves notice, it seems to me, is the role of individual Greeks who had interacted with foreigners in the views these foreigners had of modern Greece and propagated through various channels. So I can only give some uh, limited examples, but Mary and Percy Shelley were friends with Mavrocordatos in Pisa. Everett repeatedly met Corais in Paris in 1817. In 1817. Armand Carrel was explicit that he got his best information on Greece from Greeks that he interviewed. We saw Bancroft and his, Get Bancroft and his Göttingen Greeks, including people as remarkable as Polyzoides. There are other examples, but I have to stop. It seems to me, methodologically speaking, that the texts don't speak of themselves. The historical study of the context in which they were written and the biographical, prosopographical approach have much to recommend them. Thank you. Hello, I hope that uh, you can hear me and uh, see me. Yes. <laughs> Good, thank you. Oops. So I want to start by showing you 
the a graphic representation of um, the uh, connections among uh, European intellectuals in the late 18th and uh, early 19th centuries, which uh, Professor Hugh Pearson, a professor at the University of Amsterdam, has traced. And you can see here how closely European intellectuals were interconnected through their letters to one another in the 18th and early 19th centuries. And their ideas, which were revolutionary, would thus travel around Europe through their correspondence, through their books, and would also be transmitted at canon point by the revolutionary armies of Napoleon. For as Voltaire put it, books did it all. In my contribution, I want to focus on the revolutionary ideas themselves a bit more closely. I want to focus on the vision of the new and better world that they proposed. And this vision would be the goal which revolutionary activities would seek to bring about by force. I want to emphasize the Greek dimension of these revolutionary ideas. I want to highlight the fact that these revolutionary ideas were fundamentally Greek, albeit ancient Greek. This would give the Greek revolution its distinctive pathos, as Georgius said, as well as its irony, as compared with the revolutions that both preceded and followed it. The Greek Revolution must be placed in the intellectual context of Enlightenment ideas and the political context of the American and French revolutions, as uh, uh, Georgius has uh, showed us very graphically. The Greek Revolution must also be situated in the context of intense ideological struggle between the Enlightenment and what Nietzsche and Isaiah Berlin have called the counter Enlightenment romantic nationalism. Both the Enlightenment and romantic nationalism were revolutionary. They demanded a reorientation, a change in the direction of European culture. They turned attention to the ideal of freedom. But although both movements set up freedom as the highest human ideal, as in your religion, they imagined the freedom in very different ways. The Enlightenment demanded individual freedom, individual self-determination. It demanded freedom for every man, but not woman yet, to think and to know, as Kant and the encyclopedist had insisted. The Enlightenment demanded that all men be equally free from discrimination and from coercion, freedom from and freedom to, as uh, Isaiah Berlin uh, has um, uh, written. Equal liberty would also achieve human unity, uh, fraternité, as the French put it, that is peace. The Enlightenment saw in the political concept of the citizen the best way to achieve individual freedom. Citizenship would liberate and empower all the people, transforming subjects into legislators. It would achieve democracy. This democracy would, be direct, would not be direct, but modeled on English parliamentarianism, it would be a parliamentary democracy. The people would exercise their power through democratically elected representatives of their will. I'm showing you here the French Assemblée which set out to do this. Romantic nationalism, on the other hand, demanded collective freedom in the sense of national self-determination. It sought to free to free cultural communities or nations from foreign rule. Foreign rule empire distorted and destroyed the identities of nations. Romantic nationalism sought to preserve them by means of a new form of political organization, the nation state. The nation state will be one nation in every state, one nation, one state, one state, one nation. Let me show you here uh, the two metaphors of the empire, the multicultural empire on the left, uh, in a painting by Ostra Kokoschka, a multicultural, multi-colored uh, empire, and on the other side, Piet Mondrian's uh, a painting by Piet Mondrian showing 
the new principle of state formation, uh, one nation, one color in one state. The Genevan Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a key advocate of citizenship. His social contract of 1762 inspired the French Revolution and turned Napoleon into the great emancipator who would force men to be free, as Rousseau had written. Johann Gottfried von Herder and Johann Gottlieb Fichte were the advocates of romantic nationalism. They inspired the German national movement against Napoleon and directly or indirectly all subsequent national movements. Although individual liberty and national liberty would emerge as two distinct ideological goals, liberty and identity, and would make Germany rise against France many times and under different conditions, they would have equal appeal among intellectual elites and their publics across the European continent and beyond. Liberty and identity would become intertwined in revolutions and revolutionary compromises, which would seek to realize one and the other. They were intertwined in the Greek Revolution and its aftermath. Of the two movements, the Enlightenment and Romanticism, the Enlightenment was closely associated with ancient Greece. Its values, the humanistic and democratic values of 5th century BC Athens, that was seen as the golden age of Greece. The Enlightenment claimed Athens as its school, as a revival of ancient Greek values, as well as Roman, which were largely derived from Greece, the Enlightenment is also referred to as neoclassicism. Neoclassicism called for a return to the ancient Greek world and sought to make everyone Greek. And it succeeded. By the end of the 19th century, everyone wanted to be Greek. The Anglo-Americans, the French, the Scots, the English, the Germans, the Czechs, the Jews, the Russians, the Finns, and most significantly for our conversations, even the Greeks wanted to be Greek. We cannot understand either the Greek revolution or its success without European neoclassicism. The love for ancient Greece of the great European powers, France, Britain, and Russia, provided both the ends and the military means of the Greek revolution. Without this love, it would, it would have been impossible for the prime movers of the Greek uprising, those well-educated, multilingual, and economically successful, but politically and militarily powerless Greek minorities of the diaspora to lead a successful uprising in and against the Ottoman Empire. These transnational minorities, like their Jewish and Armenian counterparts, were everywhere in the great intellectual and commercial centers of Europe and functioned as key receptors of revolutionary ideas. They were in St. Petersburg, in Vienna, Amsterdam, Leipzig, as you already said, Paris, Marseille, London, Manchester, and of course, Odessa, where the Philippi Eteria was founded in 1814. European neoclassicism inspired both Korais and Ferreos, two major leaders of the Greek Revolution. And it was the same European neoclassicism that the two men and their conspirators instrumentalized in their appeals to the great powers. For it was widely expected in Europe that, mili that military support for Greek independence would ensure that, as Percy Shelley, would, as, as, uh, Percy Shelley, Shelley said, another Athens shall arise, brighter, fairer, serena. Let us briefly look at the Greek content of neoclassicism. Neoclassicism consisted in European attachment to two sides of ancient Greek and specifically Athenian culture of the fifth century BC, its politics and its aesthetics, democracy and athletic beauty. The democracy that was advocated by enlightenment thinkers, including Rousseau, was Athenian democracy. The very word was Greek. It was, oops, I'm showing you, who saw, had, and got, <laughs> I'm a bit behind with my images. I had an image of Corais and Phereus. So it was um, 
um, uh, the Greek democracy that um, uh, the Enlightenment thinkers advocated. It was a democracy to which Pericles would appeal in his funeral oration. The pursuit of Athenian democracy would radically transform the lives and capital cities of many Europeans and non-Europeans in the course of the 19th century and beyond. The French Assemblée Nationale would assume classical form and it would set up the School of Athens, the famous Renaissance image by Raphael in the Vatican as its model. The image shows the debate between Plato and Aristotle about the origin of knowledge. This debate would become the model for the free, civil, rational, and thoughtful debates that the French deputies were expected to conduct in the Salle des Débats, the debating hall of the Assemblée, where a replica of the School of Athens hangs. Replicas of democratic Athens would appear across Europe not only with the spread of the neoclassical architectural style, but also with the spread of parliamentary democracy and through it of parliament buildings. In America, in Germany, in Austria, and in Finland, which also claimed to be a new Athens, a new Athens of the North. Not only democracy, but also athletics, will become rooted in European and non-European societies. So you the, the interior of the uh, uh, Helsinki um, uh, parliament with um, these athletic figures in the, um, in the debating hall. So not only democracy, but also athletics would become rooted in European and non-European societies. And this would become so under the influence of the German thinker who advocated neoclassical values in European art, Johann Joachim Winkelmann, whom George also mentioned. Winkelmann advocated to lazy and sickly young Germans, the imitation of the athletic beauty of the ancient Greeks on which the beauty of Greek art had depended. Winkelmann would further emphasize the link between liberty and physical beauty. Liberty was a condition of beauty. The universalization of athletics would be expressed in the revival of the Olympic Games in Athens in April of 1896 by Baron Pierre de Coubertin. The new 18th century return to ancient Greece was different from that other great classical revival of the 15th and 16th centuries, the Renaissance. The Renaissance had been an elite intellectual movement. Neoclassicism, however, sought to bring Greek and Roman ideas to the people, educating them and making them sovereign and handsome. Both the Renaissance and the Enlightenment were based on the belief that Hellenism without Greeks was possible in the same way as Christianity had been possible without Jews. But it remained clear in the minds of thinkers such as Herder, Heine, Matthew Arnold, or Hans Korn, that both Hellenism and the Judeo-Christian religion, that was referred to as Hebraism, were the products of two small nations whose gravitational centers had been Athens and Jerusalem, and whose mission had been to define what it is to be human. But it was also thought, as far as Athens was concerned, that its rebirth was vital. For it would bring another golden age for humanity. It would bring even greater human progress and happiness. But this was not to be. From the point of view of enlightenment ideals and expectations, the outcome of the Greek Revolution and the foundation in 1832 of the Greek state independent from the Ottoman Empire was a disappointment. This was for two reasons. First, the Greek Revolution was for the majority of those who fought for it, a medieval crusade or a reenactment of 1453 that this time turned out to be, and with external help, at least partly a success. If anything, the Greek Revolution had been a case of romantic nationalism centered on religion. 
the triumph of Christian orthodoxy. Second, creation of the new Greek states added the new absolute monarchy to the tapestry of dynastic religious regimes of restoration Europe that had followed the defeat of Napoleon in 1815. Under King Otto of Bavaria and the so-called Bavarokratia, the Greeks did not gain their freedom. They remained under foreign rule and without self-determination, either individual or national. It was not until 1844 that King Otto would grant Greeks universal suffrage, but with limited jurisdiction, and this under duress, following a military coup in September of 1843. The building of the modern Greek state involved to a large extent the building of a modern Greek nation, the building of a modern Greek identity and unity. Modern Greek identity emerges as a cocktail consisting of three core ingredients, three parts in variable quantities. One part ancient Greek neoclassical thought that was new, one part medieval Byzantine Christian Orthodox thought that was old and living, and one part the Greek language that had survived thanks to the Greek speaking Orthodox Church. This had been Paparigopoulos, for example, account of Greece, ancient, medieval, and modern. All three parts aroused deep conflicts. The conflicts of a language, Dimotiki or Katharevusa, and the conflicts between reason and faith. These value conflicts were not specific to Greece. Greece enters the modern world by joining in the great modern cultural problem of combining, as Isaiah Berlin has noted, incompatible values. This problem would trouble Western thought from the 18th century to the present day. One central problem was that of combining the enlightenment with romanticism. How could neoclassical liberty be combined with romantic Christian as well as national identities? The second problem was that of combining universalism with particularism. In the dilemma between Greek reason and faith, or at least Judeo-Christian morality, a solution was found in the 19th century concept associated with Heine and Matthew Arnold of Hellenism and Hebraism. As sources of universal human values, Greek thinking as rational and especially scientific thinking could and should be combined with, with Judeo-Christian morality. In the dilemma between universalism and particularism, a solution was found in the belief that universal human values, that is Hellenism and Hebraism, could be combined with the national ideal by purifying it, purifying it from its dark gods. With Hellenism and Hebraism as the filter, nations would reject their inhuman and brutal ways, such as the burning of widows, slavery or ignorance, while retaining their individuality. After the Second World War, Greek reason and Judeo-Christian moral conscience would underlie and be combined in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. The world would thus accept that it was possible to exist in this way, that it was possible to be both Hellene and Hebrew. And this is because all men or human beings are endowed with reason and conscience and should act should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood, as the UN the first article of the UN Declaration stated. While the European communities and later, oops, and later the EU would explicitly base the European unity on first a common Greco-Roman and Judeo-Christian heritage, and second on the principle of unity in national diversity. And I'm showing you here the EU symbol, the 12 stars uh, representing the, the, the circle, um, the dodecaedron, the, the uh, that was the perfect uh, shape for Pythagoras, but also the 12 uh, fruits of the tree of life that we find in the Old Testament, the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. To conclude, 
the Greek Revolution can only be fully grasped if it is seen in its dual intellectual context of neoclassicism and romantic nationalism. Romantic nationalism gave it its picturesque character, its particularism. Neoclassicism gave it, on the one hand, the pathos of lost ancient glory and its universalism. Neoclassicism was not like, for example, Panslavism. It was not a movement for the freedom of a particular subdivision of humanity. It was the movement for the freedom of mankind. And one of the ironies of history is that the liberty with which Greece had been so closely associated will become the tyranny of Greece over Germany, as Jorgos again also mentioned. A tyranny that would lead to the brutality and inhumanity of the gas chambers in the name of the Greek physical ideal as liberty became detached from beauty. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you. The best I could do, we, we're all applauding um, all three of our uh, <clears throat> all three of our very talented speakers. And I'd like, first of all, just to thank uh, thank you all for um, such excellent uh, timekeeping. We have uh, we we have uh, parcelled up the time, so there there is time for some discussion. First of all, I'd suggest among the three panelists, and then as far as time allows, let's open it up to some questions coming in from. I feel to say the floor, but it's not the floor, is it? It's the uh, it's it, it's you people you right there, uh, the uh, the internet, the air. And I see some questions are coming in. Just to remind people, um, if you would like a question, um, we won't have time to get all the questions, I'm sure, uh, aired. But if you could please type a question and keep it fairly short, if you wouldn't mind, type a question into the Q and A function, which should appear at the bottom of your screen. Don't use the chat for this. Use the Q and A. Well, we've had I mean, a wealth of different uh, <clears throat> different perspectives, and also, although the three speakers coming from intellectually rather different um, sort of places on the spectrum, I think they've all converged very definitely on. Well, what can I say? The theme of the evening, the migration of ideas, that the ideas certainly we saw were on the move. And that wonderful uh, uh, diagram that Athena reproduced from Larson's book, I think showed rather wonderfully, um, you know, the, a kind of, um, a kind of, you know, the internet of the enlightenment and actually the trajectories of where all these ideas were flying between one place and, uh, and another. Um, so, I mean, just to try to draw, perhaps draw one or two um, themes together as a basis for discussion. I mean, first of all, I think as you know, as Sanya showed very eloquently to begin with, the the creative role of translation as part of the transmission of these ideas from one place to another. Um, that. Um, and you talk about the centrality of the translation, but also I think very importantly, translation as itself a political act, because whether it's the American Revolution or the French Revolution, um, a, the literal act of translation is involved in the transmission of the motivating ideas of these revolutions um, to Greece or indeed anywhere else. So ideas very much in motion um, and transforming themselves in the process, not lost in translation, but developing, changing, um, perhaps the mo uh, uh, better metaphor might be the snowball, gathering momentum as they go. And then I thought, <clears throat> I mean, from Eurius, we had in particular the, the very rich uh, digging into the expression of ideas by non-Greeks about what, um, you know, the, what Greece or Greek could mean to Europeans and Americans um, in the in the early 19th century. And I thought, I mean, some of the examples um, I, I thought were fascinating because, you know, it rather, it really rebalanced the kind of assumption that perhaps many of us bring to this, that, you know, the external viewpoint, the Philhellenes from abroad, they're really bringing into the Greek struggle and the Greek cause the you know what Joanna Joanna Hanni calls the classical debt, as you said. You know, it's the classical is classical revival, and I think George rather um, 
you know, is a timely reminder that for some really rather important figures um, in the internalization of the Greek Revolution, it actually wasn't so much ancient Greece, or they even downplayed it. It was Christian Greeks, Greeks as, as fellow Christians. Um, though whether it's ancient Greeks or Byzantine Christians, either way, the, the kind of common denominator um, surely is the perception abroad that the Greek struggle, once it gets going, is a struggle that involves all of us. Um, hence the Shelley quotation that uh, several of you uh, referred to. And then I see now, coming from a slightly different perspective, but in a, in a very balanced way, really trying to set against each other the, <clears throat> the competing heritages of the Enlightenment with its ideals and its goals, and what you termed romantic nationalism, which kind of came on the end of the Enlightenment and the two converge in, I think it's probably quite right to say, still a rather confusing way in the, in the 1820s, just at the time when the one is, is kind of ousting the other in the sort of elite uh, consciousness sensibilities throughout Europe. But, um, with, but you know, both are still in play. And I the sense I got from uh, this very nuanced and balanced presentation was that right through the story of Greece, actually right almost to the present day, there is still that interplay between opposing revolutionary ideas, which um, richly fed into the mix that is modern Greece, but in a way that often involves conflicts, which is perhaps they're still never been fully resolved. So I think you know great um, great richness in these presentations and a great deal to uh, to talk about. Um, I shouldn't talk for it, so it's enough from me. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in, but could I first of all ask the panelists? Um, are there any questions that uh, any of you would like to ask of each other? You can simply come in directly on screen while I look at some of the questions that have come from the audience. I think now. Well, I very much enjoyed uh, both your and Sanya's uh, paper, so, uh, but I want to ask uh, Sanya about um, the translations and the extent to which um, um, we can talk about, uh, you know, the, the Italian is called traditore, traduttore, uh, translator, traitor. Um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, to what extent do we have adaptations of uh, the concept, the, the word uh, liberty, the uh, liberty of freedom, um, in the different uh, in different national contexts, in the translations? I mean, it's just. Uh, I guess the betrayal is part of the inexhaustible fertility of the language itself. Um, I I don't see it as a betrayal, but as a um, a, a, a permanent adaptation. But it's a way, for me anyway, translation is a way to recover the fractures and the difficulties of translation as well. So what, what you just mentioned, lost in translation maybe, what can't be translated. And um, although the translation is deceptively simple because it seems so yeah, literal, <laughs> it's looking at literally translation. I think it's a, a wonderful tool to recover um, a different aspect of political history. Um, because translation involves both the movement of ideas and of languages and of people. And I, I think I, I, um, I liked your, also your network that you showed at the beginning. And it was reminded me just of what Yorgo said at the end about prosopography as a method to recover things. But of course, sometimes prosopography is only, it's limited by people we know. <laughs> and one thing that translation allows us to do, it's not really answering your question directly, but it allows us to recover people we might not know about actually. Uh, because some of these texts are anonymous, pseudonymous, uh, and, and so forth. And maybe you can recover who these people are by how they translate a word such as liberty, mm. uh, freedom, and so forth. But of course, these things change over time because these terms themselves gathered meaning as the revolution went on. So you have multiple generations. I mean, I didn't talk much about generation. I made it sound look very flat, but actually, um, obviously, there's a big difference difference between someone doing something in 1797 and someone doing something in 1810 or 1811 or doing something again in 1820 because what you get is the accretion of political experience so freedom doesn't is not abstract anymore it's it's something that might have very specific connotations 
in which the national language, Freiheit or British liberties or whatever it is, becomes significant for a different sort of argument. Yes. Any other questions from, from panelists to panelists? Well, in that case, let's, <clears throat> let's open it up. Um, we have a number of really rather intriguing questions. I'm afraid we're not going to get all of them. Um, but if we don't, if we're not able to air your question, um, could I suggest that there, there are email links in the, um, in the advertisement for this event. So do please send, you know, do, do please direct it either to the organizer or to one of the speakers by email. Um, so um, let's, start, let's start off with a, 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 really, a really short, punchy question. And I, I don't know who has the answer to this one. What was the, Diane um, Katsiafikas asks, what was the level of literacy among revolutionary Greeks in 1821? Yorius. You, you need to unmute. I don't know. I mean, I don't know exactly. I don't. I don't know if anybody knows exactly, but uh, we 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 clearly know that many of the leaders, the Armatoli and Cleftes, had uh, once they became sophisticated and uh, had power, they would use people who, to write for them because they they didn't know how to write themselves. It's clearly there are two Greeces there, the Greece of those who had been educated in Western Europe, and some of them came back to fight, some of them did not, uh, because they were too old, like Korais. But uh, I'm sure it was very low. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 and I don't know if, it, if there are, there might be social history of um, research that, that has uh, data. I very much doubt it, but prosopographically, in terms of examples, the number of people who couldn't write is huge, no doubt. Yes, I think now. I don't know either, <laughs> but I can imagine uh, what would have happened um, from, for example, the, the Narodnik movement in, in Russia, whereby um, intellectuals would go to the people and talk to them. And I would expect uh, priests, revolutionary priests in Greece would do the same. They would talk to the villagers and ar arouse them. And this is what the cleftus and Arbatoli would also do through uh, giving speeches, sermons to, to the local people. It wouldn't be by talk, uh, writing to them, but arousing them like you know, the, the so-called populists of today talk to, would go to the center of the village and to, to pick up your arms and fight. Yes, I mean, I think what, what Yuri said that, you know, there were two Greases. I mean, that, that rings very, I just thought that rings very true. Um, I mean, one of the extraordinary things, you know, I've discovered about, about the Greek revolution actually is what an extraordinary volume of written correspondence it generated. Even the published archives of letters that you know traveled from one part of revolutionary Greece to another, there's volumes and volumes of them. And, you know, you wonder whether everybody's, you know, living from day to day, and they don't know if they even be alive tomorrow. Um, how did they find time to write all those letters? I mean, Mavro Corvatus alone, I mean, his correspondence between 1822 and 1828 is six massive folio volumes, and, and that's sort of six years, and the rest of his long life is not yet, not yet published. On the other hand, um, such a major figure as um, the other Akolokotronis, um, I mean, in um, it was in last year, last week's panel. I think we saw uh, we saw his signature, but he actually couldn't write. He dictated his memoirs to Yorios Tetsetis at the end of his uh, at the end of his life. So you know, most of the rank and file probably did not read or write, or not very much. On the other hand, there also is um, you know a, a rather more written material. So people who could and did write, um, very much part of the revolution. Two. Let's take another question now. Um, Ariros Protopapas asks, as it's addressed to uh, Professor Leusi, did the romantic idea of collective freedom and education, as opposed to the Enlightenment idea of individual freedom and education, did that contribute to Korais' rather conservative idea that the education of the Greeks should first considerably expand before they were mature, before the revolution? I think this is a question for you, <laughs> Roddy. Well, well, it was addressed to you, I think. Right, yes. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> um, would you like to say something about Corais and uh, his role? Um, well, Corais would be on the side of the Enlightenment, although, uh, as uh, the person who asked the question uh, suggests, uh, it is true that uh, Romanticism and uh, national uh, identity or nationalism and uh, classes went together. And Corais, of course, had the idea that he should be, the Greeks should be educated in the classical um, uh, letters, the classical learning. Um, but this would be part of his enlightenment project rather than, and, and he emphasized the ancient Greek um, revival, um, Corais, rather than the Christian, in the Christian independence. Indeed, yes. I mean, Corais is rather cautious and sometimes even, even quite hostile towards the, um, well, certainly the church as an institution, not, to, not Christianity as a religion. Um, we have, um, yes, I mean, also just on Corais, I mean, the other thing about Corais is that, um, I don't know what you think about this, Athena, now, but, you know, it's some, I've sometimes felt that there is, there's quite a strong element of Romanticism and the ideas of Herder in ideas that you see expressed by Corais, not least his idea of the, you know, the ethnic nation based on the continuity of language and birth, um, and the sort of solidity of the of the nation. I mean, would you like to comment further on that? I think. Well, absolutely, yes, yes, I completely agree with you. Herder is fundamental for all the uh, the, the national movements in Europe and outside of Europe, because he emphasizes language. Language uh, carries a culture. Um, it, it carries the, what he called the national geist, the spirit of the nation. And Corais precisely emphasizes the Greek language um, and the learning of the Greek language, the ancient Greek language. Katharebus as the carrier of the ancient spirit. So he absolutely, absolutely yes. Heda is uh, brings makes Corais uh, um, um, with his linguistic and emphasis on language a romantic uh, nationalist. Mm. Oh, thank you, thank you for that. Um, Costa de la Yorgas asks: Were there any European intellectuals who were against ancient Hellenism, stroke the Greek War of Independence, due to its roots in paganism or pre-Christian ideas? I uh, would we'll say Domestro probably, I don't know if Jorgos agrees with that, because he was a very ardent Catholic. My impression is that Domestro was uh, a bit contradicting himself. Um, he, he had a love-hate relationship with the Sturza family, uh, Alexander Sturza, the Russian conservative Orthodox thinker who was of uh, Fanariot origin from the principalities, and his sister Roxandra, and so um, I, I, I had in the very end of my uh, conclusion, one more example, but I had no time, uh, which I will impose on you now. Finally, it may need to be said, I wrote, that it, wor it works both ways. I was saying all these pro-Greek people had met Greeks uh, who influenced them. It works both ways. A recent study of the Mestre Stout, after referring to, a to the close of book four, of Dupap as an uninterrupted rant against the Greeks adds more than a little resentment against Roxandra and her brother, Alexander Sturza, may have, been, may have gone into this diatribe model on Sturza's own feats of spite against Catholics in the Consideration sur la Doctrine de l'Esprit de l'Église Orthodoxe. So that's half jokingly, half um, seriously. Um, to say that he was a bit uh, self-contradictory because even in the tiny bit that I read, he was contradicting himself. He was saying that the Greeks are, have died and they are not, there's no continuity and they don't exist because of their evocation of antiquity. But at the same time, he was saying there is one Greek character and it's incorrigible. Like the ancient Greeks, the modern Greeks are com constitutionally unable of unity and things like that. And he tells us how um, dangerous they are and how are unreliable they are and all sorts of other things. He also tells us that if um, they were to abandon these Byzantine uh, accretions and nonsense and pretensions and uh, confine themselves to the classical Greece of uh, that Cicero had talked about and defined the European Greece, the Greece of the Greek peninsula, then let's talk about it. Then um, he would be supportive of the Greeks. So it's, um, he's a bit contradictory there. 
but he would be, yeah, he was negative for exactly the reasons the questioner refers to, as well as for religious reasons. Um, he, he was in favor of pan-European unity with the spiritual power of the Pope uh, playing a major role in uniting a European Commonwealth. So um, the Orthodox pretensions were anathema to him. But even people like de Bonal, who was of similar opinions otherwise, was in favor of the Greeks. Uh, there, were, there were others like Geoffroy. There are people in France, Catholics in France, who were against the Greeks um, because of the principle of legitimacy, but also for religious reasons. And there was a debate between Geoffroy, uh, who was against the Greeks, and Dubonal, surprisingly, who was very conservative and very reactionary, but in favor of the Greeks. And you could just imagine how the idea of papal supremacy would have gone down in, um, among the Orthodox faithful in the 1820s, or indeed probably at, uh, probably at any time. Um, I'm conscious of time, uh, time moving on. Um, we have one rather intriguing um, question, which might, I think might be um, a rather open-ended question for our panelists as we come towards a conclusion, well, an open-ended, surely, conclusion. Um, the question is, one-liner, would you agree that it's time for a Greek Renaissance? It depends on what uh, direction. Uh, well, exactly, it's a very open-ended question, isn't it? <laughs> yes. um, and sadly, we can't open up the dialogue with the questioner. So I would, I would be, I'd be interested to see, hear what any of you would like to make of that. Well, I, I would say absolutely, but there has always been a time for a Greek Renaissance, <laughs> Renaissance not just now, but it's long overdue, yes. Yes, I, I agree with that, um, including a, a linguistic uh, renaissance, because um, what my mother <laughs> keeps reporting to me is that uh, uh, on Greek television, the only words that she hears on chat shows and on, uh, on the news are English or French words or direct translations of um, um, English or French words into Greek. Um, so I think there is a need to revive the Greek language, <clears throat> which I think is extremely rich. And I think the Greeks should uh, stop uh, um, uh, adopting, uh, I mean, like Mitterrand tried to do, <laughs> abolish the le weekend and le sandwich. <laughs> we need a lot to bon. Eloi Babignotis, Professor Babignotis. Yes, that was um, that was widely reported, and it was in, it even even reported in the in the press in uh, in Britain, wasn't it? I'm sorry, you were, you were... No, I just... yeah. yes. The, the 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 law that was mentioned was called Loi to Bonn. I think that's what I'm. I'm not... Yeah, I mean, to, talking. I mean, Renaissance and, and uh, preserving the language and so. I mean, Sanya, um, you know, the the. Um, uh, the example, of course, is the Académie Française, mm. and the way the the, the French traditionally and from the Revolution onwards, in a way, they preserved the you know the, the 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 sort of political significance of the language. I just wondered, from your point of view, is there an, is there a way in which these revolutionary ideas could go full circle um, in terms of Greece today? Uh, Sanya, oh, you. Oh, I don't. Oh, sorry, am I? Yeah. No, you're okay now. Sorry, I'm playing around. Yes, uh, I think the Académie Française is hilarious in the 18th century because it took them forever to decide what to include in that uh, fifth edition of 1798 and uh, events absolutely surpassed them. So I'm not sure if looking backwards to the history and tradition of languages is maybe the way you have to look forwards to find new terms and new languages that aren't, of course, going to be just imported from outside. But uh, the Académie Française was very... Um, in the end reactionary, partly because it was a scholarship by committee and it took them something like 60 years to come up with the definitive dictionary of the right terms uh, that were appropriate. And by that time, of course, language had moved on. Um, so maybe I would say, I don't know about a Greek re Renaissance. Maybe um, maybe I, I'll, I'll keep neutral on that question. <laughs> well, certainly 1821 and the 200th anniversary of the 1821, 2021, and the 200th anniversary of the 1821 revolution, it does give us all the opportunity to reflect on those 200 years of history and also to place them in the context of a much longer history of the Greek language and its speakers. And as we heard in such an illuminating um, and open-ended way this evening, also um, <clears throat> opens up the, the creation and the development of 
Greece as a modern nation uh, and modern state um, into the context of the creation of the modern world, not just Europe, but uh, what we often call modernity itself, beginning with those revolutions in the United States of America in uh, the 1770s and 1780s. Um, we didn't actually today mention the South American revolutions. We possibly should just flag those up as well. Um, and of course, the development of the, the creation really of the Europe of nation states that uh, we know so well today um, in relation to the European Union and its various um, discontents and um, uh, Ongoing, uh, ongoing issues. So I think that's perhaps the note on which to thank our three panelists uh, most warmly indeed. Also Paul Cartledge on behalf of the Hellenic Society for his thoughtful observations at the beginning.